Okay, hello everybody. Does everybody know what week we're on? It's week four. So uh, it's uh, the thing that's not similar like my class is that usually, you know, week four, I don't assign new reading material, but I have time to fill on the recording, so I have to do that. So, uh, but don't worry, today's reading material is not going to be on the test, uh, it's going to be later for the final so the material that we have the first three weeks that's what's going to be on your midterm so today's material you don't have to worry about knowing so well at this time right so uh next week will be the fifth week and that's the midterm right it's like the halfway point so uh that's where we are on that hopefully you remember today's class this would be our afternoon class on mondays from 12 30 p.m. to 4.30 p.m. School code HUM 101, which is Civilization of the West. Okay. And again, uh, thank you for the students who are starting to turn in the lessons. Okay. Try to do it on a prompt time. Like you'll be seeing this on a Monday afternoon. It shouldn't take you three weeks to do this lesson or two weeks. For example, in another school, I'm doing the same thing for Monday. And they turn it into me by Thursday. Friday would be considered late. And then the weekend um, would then be absent, right? Because again, you can see this every day of the week. So it should not take you you know, five days, six days to do it, but I'm trying to be lenient here. So uh, for the people who are sending them in, please sending them in because again, the office will tell you that there's no way to make sure. I mean, I'm sure I'm gonna have some students that uh, if they're not talked to, mentioned by me or the uh, office, that you're gonna say, oh, I did it, but I didn't know I was supposed to turn in an assignment. Probably the same students that come for 10 weeks and never bring a pencil. They tell me every week, oh, I'll bring a pencil next week. And they never bring a pencil. So uh, by you sending me the questions via email with your answers, which you're a student, you're supposed to do something. Technically, if you didn't, you wouldn't be doing anything. So you do that, then that's the record the office, uh, I presume is wanting at the time for your attendance. So uh, I'm not even asking that you do it correctly. You know, if you want to write hamburger, hot dog, kimbap, that's okay. But at least you sent it in, right? Now, but uh, so just sending, you know, I'm trying to be really lenient with you. So um, let's say we get towards the end of the quarter. I don't want to receive week one on the eighth week, the ninth week, okay? So, you know, try to get them in by the end of the week if possible. But I'm glad that a lot of people are now sending them in. I mean, I, if you don't do it, I don't know how you pass the exams anyway. So it's for your benefit. Okay. All right. So today's material is going to be the 30 years war. Again, you know, I try to select, even if I look at the syllabus, now we have this class, I can't answer questions for you in person. So I will try to use it for easy information for you, easy stuff for you to remember, not really difficult. So subjects, right? Questions more along, who was this king? What did he do? No, complicated, because history questions usually here are compare and contrast, you know? Compare the Korean Koryo dynasty to the Japanese Meiji dynasty, and you're gonna sit there and write pages and pages of an essay. Or I'm just gonna ask you, you know, something like, what was King Ferdinand of Spain's name? If that's too hard for you after I put it in the question, Ferdinand, I, I don't know what to tell you. So I'm just trying to help you guys out, okay? So let's move on with this, all right? So I'm gonna go to the uh, lecture. Okay, so again, HUM 101, Civilization of the West, week four. Okay, so we're starting with the Thirty Years' War, 1618 to 
48. So the uh, 30 Years War marked the end of one era and the beginning of another. It began an era in which nation states struggled for territorial and political power. So if you're not sure about territorial, it's like uh, Tokyo is a territory. And I guess Japan and um, Korea have argued over this territory who it actually belongs to. So that's what they're talking about, territorial. Landmass, and that could be an island, and then a political power, right? So you see now we have the Democrats and the Republicans here fighting for political power. Uh, it ended the dominance of the powerful Habsburg family and began the era in which France was the strongest nation in Europe. It ended an era of Spanish military domination. If you remember last week, we talked about the Spanish Armada. Uh, it also ushered in an era in which states completed the long process of centralizing their governments, uh, becoming what we recognize today as modern nations. So it's when these large land masses or a number of states get together and they say something like, Moscow is the capital of this new country called Russia, right? Or Tokyo is the capital of Japan. Uh, the Thirty Years' War was fought over religious, dynastic, which means kingdoms, and political and territorial issues. So kind of a repeat what I've just said. So if you pay attention, this test will be easy. Uh, it was a religious war fought between Catholics and Protestants with much bitterness on both sides. It was a war of two powerful families, the Catholic Habsburgs and Protestant Wittelsbachs. That's a tough one, even for me. It was a political war in which nations fought for territorial expansion and to gain stronger positions in the balance of European power. Many historians have described the Thirty Years' War as the last religious war in Europe. This is an exaggeration, so they don't believe this to be 100% true. Religion is a powerful motivating factor in some present-day European conflicts, such as those within the United Kingdom and the Balkans. However, it is true that from 1648 on, European leaders have openly claimed political, territorial, and economic reasons for warfare, but not religious ones. Okay, that brings us to the end of this first page, 51. So let me go on and ask you some questions here as I move to the whiteboard. Write the first question. Hopefully, everybody was paying attention. And this should be easy. See, I'm going to write a long question. And I want a one word answer. Just give me one country. So, I'm going to get tired of writing, and you'll just freshly put the answer. See, I'm still writing this question. Oh, I'm tired. Okay. All right. So, first question is which country became the strongest at the beginning of the Thirty Years' War? Was it Korea? Was it the United States? Was it Mexico? So, those are pretty good guesses. But I'll tell you what, that might not be true. Okay. So, that's the first question. Okay. What was the Thirty Years' War fought over? There was a reason why it was fought, or maybe reasons. Right? 
What were these reasons? Was the war fought over a beautiful queen? Was it uh, fought over who would control the kimchi manufacturing? Or was it fought over who would own all the McDonald's on the East Coast? What was the 30 years war fought over? Question three. Which two religions fought each other? Okay, I guess I like writing two for some reason. Well, we know that's three, okay? So which two religions fought each other? Was it uh, Hindus versus Buddhists? Was it Christians versus Muslims? Which two religions fought each other? And you know, normally I ask four questions on this very first page, but you want me to be kind and only ask three? Okay, I guess I'll throw it out. You know, it, it was a simple question like who, who, which student wants me to give them a thousand dollars, but I'll throw it out because I know you don't want to answer that question. So I'll give you a few seconds to finish these three. Again, which European country became the strongest at the beginning of the 30 years war? What was the 30 years war? Oh, well, you know, it means fought over. I missed the word in there. I'm not doing my proofing there. So what did they fight it over? And which two religions fought each other, okay? So let me hit the eraser. Two, goodbye. See you later. Okay, so let me get back to this lecture. Okay, so we finished this first page 51. Make it on to 52. This is the timeline. You really don't have to remember anything here. I won't answer, I won't ask you to answer anything here. Uh, but it's just for your information, it's part of the continuum. So I'll skip the time. You don't have to identify the causes. There's a couple of things you identify, but not all. And then of course the major provisions, I think I'm gonna ask you uh, maybe one of the major provisions of the Peace of Westphalia, which we shall get into shortly. Uh, identify the major figures of the area and match each person to his or her role. Not so much, that's too long. You just know a couple of names, prominent names, but you don't have to do any uh, role matching. Okay, timeline, 1617. Ferdinand Habsburg becomes king of Bohemia, revokes letter of majesty. Again, you're not gonna have to remember when he becomes king. Uh, very rarely do I ask you any type of date question, unless it's so obvious we don't know what to do. Uh, 1618, defenestration of Prague, 30 years war begins. You might know a little date there, but I'll make it easy for you. 1619, Ferdinand II elected Holy Roman Emperor. Bohemians crowned Frederick Wittelsbach king, deposing Ferdinand. It's a lot of wordage there, don't worry. 1620, Battle of White Mountain, forgettable, don't worry about it. Edict of Restitution bans Protestantism throughout Holy Roman Empire. Good stuff to know, but you don't have to know the date. Good stuff to know. France declares war on Spain. And 1648, uh, Peace of Westphalia, 30 years war. Okay, so just some course objectives there that have to be thrown in. So here's actually onto the lecture. Uh, 30 years war is a name given to a series of religious and political wars fought in the Holy Roman Empire. from 1618 to 1648. 
in religious terms, Catholics and Protestants uh, struggle for ascendancy. So struggle, you know, is a fight. Ascendancy is, uh, means going up. So they wanted to see who would be first, who would be the number one religion, the Catholic or the Protestant. In political terms, two prominent ruling families each tried to dominate the other and several nation states fought to improve their position. Okay, as you read in chapter two, the Holy Roman Empire was not a nation. It had no form of central government. It was a loose collection of seven electorates covering present day Austria and Germany and parts of the Czech Republic. The emperor was chosen by seven ruling electors. The people of the empire spoke German, French, and Czech. In chapter four, you read that the Peace of Augsburg, 1855, don't have to know that date, stated that each elector could choose the state religion of his own principality. In 1600, three of the electorates were Protestant and the other four were Catholic. Of course, Catholics and Protestants hated one another, but there was also quite a bit of conflict within the Protestant portions of the empire. So they had their own, uh, we went over this term maybe the first week, infighting. So that's when, uh, for example, if you have a company, the people within the company fight amongst themselves. So, there was conflict and infighting within the Protestant portions of the empire. For instance, Calvinist loathe, which is a high level word for it, really hate someone. You just can't stand the sight of them. Calvinist loathe Lutherans, believing that they were too far lax in their approach to religion. Lax is a high level word uh, meaning lazy more or less. So the Lutherans felt they were, or Calvinists uh, felt they were more dedicated and Lutherans were a little too lazy in their approach or style to religion. In the early modern era, European rule was a familiar family affair. Don't forget that, that's key. Uh, European rule is a family affair uh, rather than an official form of government as we understand government today. So kind of like a Kim Jong-un style. Because you know, we're not sure if he's alive or dead this last week. And they're saying if he's dead, the sister might possibly take over or an uncle. So that's a family style ruling, not a governmental style. Uh, if Trump dies today, they're not gonna put his son or his brother up there. Right, that, that's a governmental thing where they're gonna choose somebody that's elected. Uh, national borders changed with bewildering rapidity. So bewildering is like very highly level confused. So once I'm bewildered, I, I don't know my left from my right. Rapidity means speed. As monarchs died and passed their authority and their lands onto their children. Again, a very Kim Jong-un uh, style. And I guess that's what's going to happen with uh, China since he, Mr. Ping, is now the ruler forever like Mao. So if he passes, I don't think they're going to vote anybody in. It's probably going to be, uh, I think he has a son. So, yeah. Uh, kings, princes, and electors of Europe ran their territories in much the same way that a lord ran his estate. The territory was considered to be similar to private property. The king owed his subjects his protection in return for their obedience. And obedience means that they will follow every and all the rules, no fighting against the rule. Otherwise, he will not uh, protect them. The two most important and influential ruling families in the Holy Roman Empire were the Wittelsbachs and the Habsburgs. As of 1600, there was religious dissension 
A religious dissension means it's like the conflict or infighting. People were not agreeing on things and getting along about certain issues. That's dissension. Within each family, although the Habsburgs were mainly Catholic and the Widowbacks were mainly Protestant, one major figure emerged in each family in the early 1600s. Ferdinand Habsburg, elected King of Bohemia in 1617, you don't have to remember the date, and the Holy Roman Empire two years later, and his rival, Frederick Wittelsbach. So just kind of remember Wittelsbach, Habsburg, that's it. Uh, the Thirty Years' War falls into three major phases, although fighting continued in various parts of the empire throughout the entire span of time. So from the beginning to the end of their rules, there was always fighting. Okay, this brings you to the end of 53. So let me go down to the questions. Question four. Here's the first question. Which years was the 30 years war fought? Oh my God, teacher, you're asking a, a date or dates. We don't like that. Okay, um, if you see the beginning of the page we just did, the numbers there in bold, and you know it's 30. So, you know, even if you wanna lie, you say, oh, it's 1600 to 1630. I can give you some points for that. But the top of the page, it's written like your license plate number, so. You can get that. That's not hard. You just give me the, actually the two years. So one connected to the other. Okay, five. How was the early European rule? So I'm like, what do you mean how, how was? Was it enjoyable, teacher? Is that what you mean? Was it not enjoyable? I'm just asking for the style. How was the style of rule? I'll give you one hint, Kim Jong-un. Okay, that is your hint. Right. And then the last question for this page, and hopefully you paid attention to this one. It's kind of wrapped in or connected to five. Okay, last one for 53. Uh, why did the national borders change quickly? Again, you'll find the answer, uh, answer six connected to five. So there was a reason why the borders were changing a lot. Right? So again, I'll give you a few minutes to write these down so no one accuses me of erasing them too quickly. Or which years was the Thirty Years' War fought? So 
Give me the first year and then the last year. That's all you have to do. And you'll know you're correct if they're 30 years apart. Um, how was the early European rule? What was the style of rule? It's a certain style. And your hint is Kim Jong-un or Kim Il-sung or the other fellow, the papa. And then six, why did the national borders change quickly? Again, that had to do with the, the answer to five, okay? So now I can erase these. Hopefully everybody's enjoying themselves as the weather gets warmer. Okay, four, see you later, bye. Five and six, okay? So now I've already done two pages. Wow, going too fast. I think I'm scheduled for us to do 30 pages today. So just be strong. Make sure you have a water. Okay. All right. Um, so I have finished the bottom of 53. So now I'm going to move on. And uh, if you had the book, like, Li Xuan a lot of times has to buy the book, otherwise she gets angry with Wani and then refuses to bring me a boba. So I love boba so much I ask, let me have the drink, no boba. So we are on uh, the bottom of 56, okay? So let me start reading that for you. Uh, results of the 30 years war. Yes, we want results, right? That's what we want. Uh, the peace of Westphalia cemented the work. So you know what cement is? That's what they pour in front of uh, the buildings on the streets. The sidewalks are made from cement. So when they harden, they're connected. So that's what the metaphor is here. The peace of Westphalia cemented the work begun under Ferdinand. The creation of a unified Austrian nation state which would before long become the Austro-Hungarian, Hungarian, excuse me, I've been to Hungary, famous for their goulash, Hungarian empire. The Habsburgs would continue to rule Austria into the 20th century. It's a long time. Kind of like what we were talking about, uh, the uh, czars all the way till 17, or 1917. Provisions of the Peace of Westphalia. Restored borders within the Holy Roman Empire to their 1624 locations. Revoked the Edict of Restitution. Restitution is when you give something back that was originally taken away. Gave Alsace to France. Alsace-Lorraine is a skinny little country between Germany and France. And for many hundreds of years, they've kind of traded back who owns that country. Famous now for their beers. Uh, so a lot of folks there speak French and German. Uh, recognized Switzerland and the Netherlands as independent nation states. Made a Bavaria. Prussia, Saxony, and Württemberg self-governing independent states within the Holy Roman Empire. That's pretty nice. You have your own power. Created a unified Austrian Empire, including Bohemia, Moravia, Silesia, and parts of Hungary. And guess what? You don't have to remember those obscure places like Moravia and Silesia. Don't worry. Teacher's not going to be mean. Uh, since the war uh, had been fought entirely within the Holy Roman Empire, the Germans suffered most from the violence. of a total ethnic German population of about 17 million. Historians agree that between 3.5 million and 
7 million died. Additionally, millions of acres of farmland were laid waste, which means destroyed. And foreign troops were released from combat duties were roaming the countryside. So you're a foreign soldier and they say, okay, you got your freedom now, but they just let you go. So when you roam the countryside, you're just walking the countryside like a homeless person. They didn't send me on a bus back to, you know, my home. Like here, you know, when they catch illegal people, they send them on a bus back to the border and they can enter into Mexico if they're from Mexico. But here they just let you go like in downtown LA or San Francisco, and they said, okay, walk back for soldiers. Uh, looting and murdering. So looting, we know that happens here when they have some kind of riot here, and then people break into buildings and homes and steal anything they want. That is looting and murdering. We know what that is. I don't have to explain that. German unification, which had seemed possible in the early 1600s, was set back for some time to come. Okay. So, get this. Okay. With North Central Europe devastated by war, France emerged as the dominant nation state. Spain had lost its navy during the defeat of the Armada. Again, what we talked about last week when we did Spain and Armada was all the ships that they had that were destroyed. Italy was still a collection of city states, so uh, it had not formed as a nation state yet. And they were constantly being invaded by Austria or France. I don't know why. Why do they have to invade? The Italian food's pretty tasty. Uh, and England. Wow, that's pretty far. Because they have to come across the channel. Uh, as always, maintain a measure of isolation on the far side of the English Channel. There you go. Uh, by contrast, France, France was a large, continuous landmass, like a big box with a strong central position on the continent and it had a strong central government. It would remain Europe's greatest power until Napoleon's defeat at Waterloo in 1850, or 1815. I was born in 1850, I, I get that confused sometimes. Um, the Holy Roman Empire would continue to exist on paper on paper, so that's how we say now, technically. But the emperor would have only nominal authority, which means very little authority. Uh, so, you know, again, if I use a, a term or an example like Kim Jong-un, his sister looks pretty tough and I'm sure she has some power, but it's very nominal compared to Kim Jong-un. I'm sure she might suggest something to him, but he's going to do what he wants to do. Four of the electorates, Prussia, Bavaria, Saxony, and Württemberg, were made of independent, self-governing states owing pro forma allegiance. Allegiance is when you declare your loyalty. Here it is, allegiance to the emperor. So supposedly everyone, whatever country you're from, Korea, United States, Russia, you have an allegiance to your country, right? So here, not necessarily to Trump or if Hillary Clinton was the president, not to her, but to the country itself. But here you had allegiance to the emperor. Uh, emperor was all powerful. The others were made part of the Austrian empire. So the peace of Westphalia was a result of the monarchs and ministers gathering together. The first time this had happened in European history. The nations agreed to recognize one another's sovereignty. 
Okay, here's another issue here. Every country uh, up, up until this day has their own sovereignty, which says we are a country unto ourselves. We have laws that protect us and our citizen, right? And if you follow somebody, I don't know what will happen, but if you follow somebody like Hillary Clinton, who in her campaign was promoting open borders, then a country would lose its sovereignty. So I don't know what would happen with the citizens. If you're a citizen and then they say open borders and people come from another country, all of a sudden you don't have any rights that protect you. Everybody's the same. It's very strange. So. Sovereignty has worked since the beginning of time. Uh, who's to say what's going to happen in the future? But sovereignty is, uh, you know, like Korea has a right to protect itself. So does Japan. They have their own sovereignty above anything else. Uh, and to create and maintain a balance of power that would prevent future wars. So that's where we go in earlier where I talk about having the princesses marrying other princes from other countries so that it stops or attempts to stop people from uh, going to war. So if I'm a prince in Spain and I marry a prince in, a princess in Greece and then I become the king, I might not want to attack Greece since my wife is from Greece and then our kids are mixed. So these were attempts to uh, prevent future wars. The Peace of Westphalia was thus an important first step toward recognizing or observing that affairs of state could be settled around a conference table rather than on a battlefield. And that's pretty cool. That's a, what they call now forward thinking. They want people to discuss issues instead of all the many wars that they had previously. They don't like somebody or they're upset, you know, send a thousand troops out there to fight. This way, hopefully things would be settled uh, on a conference table, but we know when you deal with humans, that's not always the case, okay? So um, let me get to the questions. Okay, the Habsburgs, the Habsburgs family ruled which country? Oh, wait a minute here, let me, I did a little misspelling. I put country, I don't know what that means, country. I want some country, oh yes sir, every day. Okay, so that's country, okay, I'm not from the south. Some is and sauces. So the Habsburgs ruled which country? Was it Taiwan? Was it? Indonesia? No, I think that at that time that was uh, Queen Caroline was the uh, ruler of uh, Indonesia at that time. Okay. Next one. And, uh, uh, Oh, I'm writing all these long questions and you're going to write short answers. I'm jealous. Oh, my fingers just got tired. 
Okay. What was the most important provision of the Peace of Westphalia? So I think that was a four or five parter. So I'm only asking you one, which was the most important one as far as the effect on the biggest amount of people, okay? So I'm just asking you one. Don't worry about this. And write the one you think that's more important or the most important. It, it was the one that gave all the, the citizens free donuts. Yeah, 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 that was it. Okay, no, that wasn't. Okay, 10. Uh, which country suffered the most from the 30 years war? Which country? Uh, was it Mongolia? Was it Brazil? Possibly Hong Kong? Which country suffered the most? For example, does anybody know which country lost the most people, including soldiers in World War II? I'll give you three seconds. One, two, three. It was Russia. Russia suffered the most as far as loss of people, uh, citizens and soldiers put together. So there's a different country here, which I'm asking about in this time during the 30 years war, which started sometime 1600 something and lasted for 30 years. So trying to help you on the prior question. So here's another question. So this one's a little more specific, but it's connected. So if you know 10, you should find 11. Okay, so 11 is connected to 10. Excuse me. About how many people died? Now, if this is in class, this is usually when I have a smart student like Alex or somebody say, uh, uh, teacher, which country did you say? <laughs> and then they expect me to make a mistake and say the country. So I can't say the country. Otherwise, I'd put it in the question. So once you figure out the country in 10, you will have the number close by. So about how many people died. And please don't be funny. It's, oh, I think it was about three. I've never known only three people to die in a war. So it's a pretty big number, okay? Okay, so next question. Okay, I have to ask this technically, but I can break it down for you. Uh, and it was in the reading, so don't worry. I won't leave you hanging. Okay. Um, I think this is the last one for this reading part here. I gave you, ooh, five, but... Uh, the last one was only two, so I'm getting tough now. But there was a kind of a fusion of two pages, so don't worry. I'm not being cruel. Uh, which country emerged as the dominant nation state? Now, again, teacher, I forgot what emerged was. What if, it's too big. I want a milkshake, okay? Um, I'm only using the emerged here because you will find it connected to the answer. But basically what I'm asking you, easy English, is which country became the dominant nation state. But if you look for emerged, you'll find the answer in the book. See how kind I am and you don't even know it, right? I'm trying to say I'm too tough. So again, I'll give you this time right now to answer these five questions, or excuse me, write them down. That's the most important thing for right now because I have to erase them. 
and then you can watch my lecture as much as you want until you find. So it's not a point of you trying to fill in the answers right now. Just make sure you have the question. Okay, so go ahead and do that. So again, repeating, the Habsburgs ruled which country? Again, it was not Indonesia or Hong Kong. Uh, nine, what was the most important provision of the peace of Westphalia? So again, think about that. Which decision actually affected the most people? Not one of the minor provisions. Uh, 10, which country suffered the most from the 30 years war? So, which country lost the most people? And then once you find that, you can easily answer 11, which is about how many died. So again, when I ask about how many, you know, like let's say we'll make it easy. Let's say that it was a different question, but let's say it was only 12 and you put 10, you know, it was 132 and you put 130. That's why I said about how many, I will give it to you. But if a thousand people died and you only put 29, you're way too far away. So that's why I'm giving you a chance to get more points. And then uh, which country emerged as the dominant nation state? So which country became the most powerful nation state? All right, I guess I have to saddingly move to the eraser. So eight's gonna go to Lou. Nine's gonna end. Yes or 10, 11 is going to end, 12 is going to end. Okay, so let me return to the lecture. Okay, so we finished this. We have to move on. Okay, to the age of monarchy technically would be 61 in your book if you're Ishran. So again, monarchy means kings. Yep. All right. Slowly but surely we shall proceed. Uh, the period from the Treaty of Westphalia in 1648 to the French Revolution in 1789 was truly the age of absolute ruler. Again, what we would call today a dictator, someone like uh, Fidel Castro, our familiar buddy, Kim Jong-un, who we're not sure is alive or well, Joseph Stalin, Adolf Hitler, something like that. Uh, powerful monarchs ruled all the nations and principalities of Europe. They believed in the doctrine of the divine right of kings. So doctrine are your, is your rule book. So the rule book of the divine right, divine coming from heaven. Again, you have Protestants and Catholics. So they believe the king would tell you, a uh, God sent me here and uh, I'm your king, right? So there's no way about arguing that somebody should vote somebody else in. God sent me, so shut up, okay? Certain conditions were necessary to maintain a strong central monarchy. The monarch must control the aristocracy, which is the high level people around him, whether they are religious or just, uh, you could say governmental. 
ensure the loyalty, so that means make sure the loyalty and obedience of the army, run the administration, everything's about paperwork, efficiently from the seat of government or what they call the king's throne and the pursue a clear foreign policy. So much more clear than what we have today. Uh, you know, the United States might want to get tough with China, but they have trade with China. They do a lot of things that they feel is beneficial. So, you know, at the previous time, they were a little more strict. In the past, Struggles for thrones had been common. Members of royal families had been known to murder one another or engage in civil wars in their desire for power. Once a monarch had power, he or she could never feel secure. One of the best ways to protect the throne was to keep control over the nobles. The most likely and most powerful source of any conspiracy against the monarch. So, uh, again, we talk about murder in the royal families. Again, if we go to Kim Jong-un, you know, we have the reports of him killing one uncle with uh, an airplane machine gun. We all know what happened to his younger brother uh, when he was in Southeast Asia at the airport, right? Or I'm sorry, older brother? I, I thought it was his younger brother. But I mean, it's not important which, what ages is he just had his brother uh, poisoned, shall we say, killed by the ladies. Uh, so these things have been going on since the beginning of time. I think also in Mongolia, didn't they? poison Temujin's father, who later became Genghis Khan. So all these people fighting over power. And a lot of times it's the people closest to you that you think uh, will protect you. Uh, and again, it says here, keep control of the nobles um, and then the stress. So very stressful, you can't trust anybody. So people like Kim Jong-un or Fidel Castro, uh, they move their location a lot. They might live in some house for 30 days or 60 days, and then they move to another location. And then after 60 days, another location, because they're afraid of being assassinated or killed. So the stress is part of the package of being a monarch. Uh, during the Middle Ages and beyond, Armies were made of small, localized units. These troops usually remained loyal to the Lord for whom they fought. The 17th century saw the birth of the National Standing Army. So I guess they didn't have full armies at the time, which owed its loyalty to the monarch again as the head of the state. So the army did not even have its loyalty to the people, but to the king. A loyal army would not support an uprising among the common people or the nobility. See, just like I said. So if you wanted to have an uprising and you said, hey, you have to support us, the king is being bad, they're not gonna help you or even the nobility. Instead, the monarch would use the army to crush the rebellion or kill you. So, proceed to take my class uh, for a later time in European history. For example, in Moscow, uh, when Tsar Nicholas, which was the last Tsar in 1917, people were outside, outside of his palace rightfully protesting. The army didn't say, hey, these people need some more food or they need this. No, they listened to the king and they went out and attacked the people to get them out of there. So that's who the army uh, owed their loyalty to, was the king. Okay. So it's time for a couple of uh, questions here.
Okie dokie. What did all, and I do mean all, and I went over this in the lecture, what did all European monarchs believe at this time? They all believed in something. Um, the only hint I'll give you, this is the most important thing. I mean, don't, don't put me something minor and say, well, okay, yeah, they believed in that. But the most important thing, this was central to them maintaining their position in power forever. So it was a pretty important uh, issue, okay? And I think I'll be kind and only ask you, oh, sorry, I was gonna do two, but I guess I'll do three. Don't be too upset. Next question. Okay, 14, which conditions were necessary to ensure a strong central monarchy or kingdom? Again, I'm trying to help you with uh, questions that might appear, or at least in this form on the midterm or the final. I put conditions, that's a plural noun, not one. So. A lot of students, again, make a mistake and they only write one. There was about four or five conditions I saw, we read about, but uh, again, you're gonna write two, you get more than the guy that writes one. You write three, but you don't necessarily have to write all, but I'd like to see a good, uh, a good foundation there of what you write. So there were certain conditions that you needed to have or control to ensure that you had a strong central monarchy. If you're weak in these areas, well, you might lose your position as king, right? People will rebel or poison you or do something, right? Everybody wants that power. Okay, the last one for what would be 61. Okay, so the last one for what would be page 61 in the age of the monarchy, which group of the groups that were under the monarch was the most powerful, that's a big hint, and thus likely to make a conspiracy against the king. So obviously that would not be the peasants, right? And uh, again, if you're, what, I, I forgot what's a conspiracy. I'm writing conspiracy there because if you look for conspiracy in your lecture, you shall find the answer. If I break it down to too easy English, then you might not be able to find it. So you look for that and you'll get the answer. So I'm being kind to you. It's not, it's not the reverse, it being me. Teachers using big words, don't like it. So again, at this point, I will give you a few minutes to answer these three or actually write them down. They're kind of long, so take your time. Write down the three questions.
Okay, so everybody's hanging in there. Um, you're my group in LA. I wonder if anybody felt the earthquake on, uh, was it a Friday night, right? Three, 319 in the morning, a 3.3 .3 earthquake. I actually fell asleep probably 305 and I passed out from a NyQuil, so I did not feel it. But if you remember about a week and a half ago, we had a prior earthquake, you know, maybe nine or 10 at night, I felt that one. So we've had like two 3.3s. The one from a week and a half ago was a 3.7. So just wondering if anybody felt those earthquakes, okay? So hopefully I've given you enough time to answer these questions. So I shall go get the dreaded eraser. Maybe Inky likes the eraser. Erase all that stuff. Yes, Inky. So 13 again, what did all European monarchs believe in this time? Okay. 14, which conditions were necessary to ensure a strong central monarchy or kingdom? 15, which group? So again, one word answer. Which group was the most powerful and likely to make a conspiracy against the king? Okay, so I think we're winding down and getting to the end of our lecture. Okay, so I just finished reading this. So we shall proceed to page, the next page, which is 62. Guess what? We're only going to read half a page. Oh dear, I'm being too kind. Uh, do you want me to do 10 more pages? If you give me a few minutes, I'll go to the book and I'll make up about 20 more questions. Does that sound good? Really? Okay, I'll do that if you want. Probably only Tamir wants me to do that, or maybe Tal. Tal loves to read and endless questions. She usually cries when there's not enough questions, so I don't want to make Tal sad. Okay. So here we go. Ancient Rome uh, had existed as a centrally controlled empire with a vast, and we know vast, vast is very, very large. South Korea is not that large of a country, but China and Russia are vast countries. They're so big. I think Russia is bigger than China, unbelievable. So they control an empire with a vast bureaucracy. So that means paperwork what we call red tape. In the 17th century, European states began to pattern themselves on the Roman model. The civil service was essential to control all the territory outside the capital city. It was responsible for collecting taxes, settling court cases, and so on. No central government could contain or maintain, pardon me, no central government could maintain control over the people without having an efficient civil service. And that's what we're supposed to have now in the United States. Um, so they talk about, oh, we're gonna send everybody these uh, things known as stimulus checks. And I think, uh, Millions of people have still not received them. So I don't know if the civil service is efficient. People are hiding, I don't know. It's probably the civil service. Uh, and finally, defending the national borders was an important aspect of maintaining power. No ruler could remain secure on his throne without a clear foreign policy, which again is a repeat of earlier. So is the maintaining the borders again, that goes to your sovereignty. Monarchs had to maintain defensive alliances, which means have other countries as your friends to help protect you, like North Korea has China as a big brother to protect, help protect them. And strive or fight to maintain the balance of power among nations. They also had to take steps to avoid being 
overwhelmed by hostile neighbors. So again, if you've got some really angry neighbors, so to say, people in the country next to you, they might try to attack you a lot. So you need to do something, take some steps to avoid this situation from happening or calming those folks down. Okay. So this is the end of our reading for the fourth week. So let me get to the, I think I'm gonna ask, even though it's only half of a page, I'm gonna ask about 19 questions. So let's get ready to get to the whiteboard. Please don't fade Inky or my other students that might possibly faint. Okay, so how many questions do you think I'm actually gonna ask? on half a page, 19 or just one. Okay, let me flip a coin, find out. No, I shall be kind as usual, you know, I'm too kind. So the last question for today, the fourth week material. Look at that, 16 to 17, cute. Okay, last question for the week four material. 17th century Europe copied which model of government? So they copied some other country's style of government. Which one was it? Was it maybe Thailand's style of government? knows right well you'll know if you look at the lecture material so i'll give you a few minutes to answer this last question and then i'm going to talk a little bit about secret information right okay all right so that should be that to wrap up our fourth week material so let me get the eraser Okay, so the students who have been following and looking at the lectures, like the good students that they are, they're gonna say, hey, then we're done. We can finish. But if you're looking at a clock, uh, we're 20 minutes early from doing the designated time of an hour and a half. We're 20 minutes early. Should I be kind and let you leave? Oh. Maybe somebody's left already, that's not too good. But if you have, that would be good. And then I'm gonna have other students, like maybe Sodom, they're gonna say, hey, why don't you go over the other questions? We don't know if we're correct from the homework that you forced us to do when you got tough. So I can use this time and I will go over the questions of the first three weeks which will be today's material, no, I don't wanna to throw too much at you. So the first three weeks material, I will go over the questions right now and that's what's gonna go on your midterm, uh, which you will see next week, okay? All right, so let me put away the week four material. Pull out the questions from the first three weeks. All right. Um, so, you know, usually I ask a lot of questions and uh, I throw a lot out for the test. So don't worry, I'm just trying to go over as many as I can today to help you, but I, I'll, I'll throw away some, most of the ones that I think are too difficult or too long of an answer for you. Uh, try to give you the shorter ones. But uh, I'll let me go over these the best I can for the first three weeks, okay? So, 
When did Russia become an empire? The answer to that is 1600. Okay, now what were the new Russian empire's major goals? And they had four, you don't have to list all four. Uh, break away from Tartar authority. Okay, Tartars were the one making them pay the penalty. Consolidate power under an absolute monarch, so become uh, controlled by a king. Uh, they needed a capital city. I've talked about that before. All these places that become a nation state need a capital city. And four, expand uh, the empire for strategic and trade purposes. So strategically is to expand it to you make it harder for people to invade your country. It's a strategy. And then expand it to where you can maybe connect with another country and help trade. Because if you remember, Russia was a vast area of a lot of snow. and They didn't have really good trade routes. Okay. So uh, who was Moscow's ruling family? The Danilovich family. Okay. What also played a unifying force at the creation of the Russian Empire? So it wasn't only the king and the soldiers, but a theme we've gone through many, many times, the Orthodox Catholic faith. So religion always played the strong role for all these countries. It's a two-headed coin there. Who did the Russians uh, have to overthrow to become an empire? The Tartars. Again, same answer as the one I did prior. Those were the enemies. Those were the bullies. Okay. What were, let me see, yeah. What were the two problems in trying to form a strong Russian middle class? So again, the Russian climate or severe winter, the vastness of the country which is the geography. So again, I'm not gonna ask you all these questions, but throw away the longer ones. And you know how I'm kind, I'll try to give you the shorter ones as possible. Uh, who led the Russians in battle against the Tartars? Why, of course, well, I thought it was Temujin, but it was Prince Dmitri. Yes, then 10. How did Russia uh, attract men to join the army at this time? Did they offer them candy, free women, free wives? No, they offered them land for life. So after the war, they could go back to their land and grow things and be happy. And when they died, they could give it to their children. Okay. So now we'll proceed to the uh, second week. We got into Ivan the third and a little bit of the fourth. Okay. So in 1530, Ivan became emperor. How old was he? Okay, he was not that strong. He was only three years old. Right. Let me separate this for you. Okay, Ivan the fourth. Oh, I'm sorry. He would later become known as. Do we know what he was? Known as? No? Okay, so again, Ivan the Fourth. Actually, I'm skipping up to four. Yeah, let me go through uh, 31 here. So, uh, what did Ivan the Three make the official emblem of Russia? It's the two headed eagle. That is the symbol. Okay. And 
then what uh, what did Ivan the Third force Lithuania to call him? The Lord of all the Rus, which meant Russia. Who did Ivan the Three say he was descended from? The Roman Caesars. That's what he said. He was a direct descendant, even though I think that was not the case. And uh, why were Russians suspicious of Westerners at this time? And that's because they were not Orthodox Christians. So they did not have the same faith. So they did not trust them. Okay. Under Ivan III, how large did Russia expand? Uh, make it easy. Three times its original size. Three times. So hopefully I won't see an answer like three and then a multiplication number. Sign. Okay, I think 14 and 15, I'm gonna throw out. It might be too long for you to answer. See, I'm already throwing out questions for you. Okay. Um, uh, it was gonna be like, well, what is the advantage of ruling Russia at this time? And then what's a disadvantage? So again, remember the disadvantage is the vastness of the country, right? Too, too large. Okay, but I'm gonna throw those out. So again, uh, I'll repeat myself. I, sc I skipped ahead in 1530, Ivan IV. Now we're on to Ivan IV. He became emperor. How old was he? Three. Okay. And, um, what would he later be known as? His nickname was Ivan the Terrible because of the bad things that he did. Okay, Ivan IV passed the first land restrict or land restrictive. What law restricting what? This law restricted the mobility of the peasant class. So you'll see every monarch is doing this. They don't want people to move and gain power and connection. They want to keep them in a central area. Okay. Uh, under Ivan the Fourth, what did his military create? Okay, I'll give you a hint there. It has to do with some kind of special units right? Dealing with bullets and rifles, right? Before him, they just increased the army, but he made specialized units. What strange thing did he do in 1581? He killed his son in a fit of rage. Okay. And there could be some others I could throw in, like Opri Chiniki means what? So remember the secret police. Present day would be Kagebe. And then maybe who succeeded Ivan IV? Was it Joseph Stalin? So I'll let you mull over that one. Okay, here's another one I think I'm going to throw out. It's too long, too confusing. Be kind there. Maybe I'll say, what was the time of troubles, right? So look for that one. Okay, and uh, which countries fought each other at this time? Sweden, Poland, and Russia. Those were the countries that fought each other. Okay. And then the last for the second week, Again, a strange term, I'm gonna throw it out. Okay, here's good. Which foreign army returned the Russian king to power in 1605? Remember the last one, which countries were fighting? Russia, Poland. Okay. You remember the last one? Sweden, so one of those countries. So it probably wasn't Russia if it's foreign. So you got a choice between the two. And then they brought the king back to Russia, but what happened to him? Okay. We're talking about poisoning and different things. He was murdered, poor guy. He was murdered, terrible. Okay. All right, so now we'll do the Spain in the 1500s and then we shall be done. Okay. 
again, I might not go over all, but most, the most important. Okay, what kind of country was Spain at this time? Again, 1500s. Not a unified nation, but a collection of principalities, so kind of like states. What was the goal of Spanish monarchs at this time? Again, control over the population, control the people. Some say we're being controlled right now by the governor of California, forcing us not to go anywhere, to be in lockdown. Why were the Spanish nobles loyal to the throne? Okay. Because like anything else, they were offered salaried offices and titles that accompany them. They didn't want to lose these positions. Okay. Who established the Spanish Inquisition? King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella. Which groups were affected by this? The Jews and the Muslims. If you remember, they wanted to rule with a one religion authority. So people had to give up their religion or leave the country. And some Jews and Muslims still practice secretly their religion. The Inquisition was very effective for what? So maintaining control by fear, by fear. Okay, seven, where was the last Muslim stronghold in Spain at this time? So where was the last area that Muslims were still fighting and had not been kicked out of the country? And that was Granada. In 1516, who was crowned King of Spain? No, it was not Temujin. It was Puridi. No, it was Charles the First. Why did Charles the First engage in a series of wars in Europe? He wanted to wipe out Protestantism. Again, it's that Catholics versus Protestants, and uh, revive Europe under the Catholic faith. You know, this other one looks a bit long. The 10 one give some reasons why Spain in the 1550s was the most, and you have to supply four, forget it. I'll wipe it all out. Don't worry about it. I'm trying to keep this simple. Okay, where was Spain's first national capital? Was it Seoul? Was it Yokohama? Was it Mexico City? No, it was Madrid. Again, this is easy. Philip only allowed which religion to be practiced. I just said it. Catholicism. That's why the Jewish people and the Muslims had problems. Okay. Um, what was... Uh, hmm, maybe I'll throw this up. Okay, well, okay, this is easy. What was Mary Tudor's nickname? Sunday afternoon, you want something for your hangover. Bloody Mary. Okay. What was the name of the giant Spanish fleet of all those ships? Many, 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 many ships sent to attack England. The Armada. Okay, and this one's connected to it. I think I'll just throw it out. Be kind. Okay, so we're done with the review. And again, I will throw out even more for the review. You won't get all the ones that I asked you, okay? But maybe you get a surprise question to make sure you watch the lecture and pay attention. But it'll be something obvious, don't worry. So again, um, have a good time. Let's hope there's no more earthquakes. This has been fun. And uh, next week I will give you some new material, but We'll also, I, I shall also give you the test. So until then, I shall see you. So be good. Okay. Bye bye.